Well, before we move to the uh, subject of the Cold War and how that provided such a remarkable uh, garden in which the Nazi flowers could grow and blossom, so to speak, uh, tell us about the Bank for International Settlements and how that fits into the dynamics that you have been telling us about. Well, the Bank of International Settlements is a scandal. I mean, if, uh, it's it's a scandal by anybody's um, metric. We have um, a bank that was set up by the the brilliant financier Hjalmar Schacht. Uh, Schacht was one of those people who was part of that circle uh, around Himmler and around Hitler to support Hitler's um, nomination to be Chancellor of Germany. Schacht was the, the the man who engineered Germany's economic recovery after World War One. He helped to rearm Germany, to remilitarize it, uh, sometimes by using uh, very dubious means, by having armaments built in different countries, by having, his, uh, by having troops trained in different countries. He was able to move money around, move people around, and he created something called the Bank of International Settlements. This was supposedly to pay German war reparations after the end of World War I. Uh, there had been some very onerous uh, debts, were laid uh, against the, the door of Kaiser's Germany, and Germany was expected to pay back the costs of the war to all the countries that they had invaded, they had fought with. Uh, the Bank of International Settlements was intended to do this. Of course, it never really did. Uh, they never really paid any reparations out of that bank, but Schock used it as a very convenient way to launder money for the Reich. The bank was headquartered in Switzerland. Um, most of the members of the bank, the board of directors, were either Nazis, or uh, by, the, by the 1930s, were either Nazis or were people who were uh, bankers from the occupied territory, such as Czechoslovakia. So you had people who were part of the Third Reich actually running the bank, except that the president of the bank was an American, Thomas McKittrick. Uh, Thomas McKittrick was an excellent financier. Uh, he had his eye on the ball as far as the money was concerned. He was able to help the Reich launder money to move money around, to bury gold uh, in Switzerland, to create false accounts, to do all the things that the Third Reich needed to keep um, to keep conducting their war effort. And in fact, he was so in favor of it that right in the middle of World War II, as American troops are fighting and dying in Europe and in Asia, uh, McKittrick is making speeches to financiers in the United States saying not to worry about the Third Reich, uh, not to worry about their investments in Germany, that Hitler is solid and the Reich is solid, and uh, they have nothing to worry about, basically. Uh, actions that would be considered treasonous uh, under any other circumstances, like the, like the actions of, of the Rockefellers during the war, especially John D. Rockefeller, who would have been considered uh, a traitor. Uh, McKittrick would have been considered a traitor as well, but he wasn't. Uh, the Bank of International Settlements still exists. It's one of the most secretive banks in the world. It is a banker's bank. Uh, it's where the bankers keep uh, the bank's uh, transactions secret, so secret that uh, for years there was no electronic uh, communication in or out of the bank. Everything was done by very quiet men in quiet rooms with a telephone call, and money was moved around that way. Uh, it was moved out of Europe. It was moved to various safe havens around the world. BIS was um, and still remains uh, a bank that has no accountability, no transparency. Uh, you can look at the the bank's uh, website. You can try to figure out some history of the bank, and it's extremely opaque. <laughs> there is no way for, on the bank's own website where it discusses what they did during World War II or the fact that it was created by Hallmar Schacht, uh, which was Hitler's banker, the man who created the German economic miracle, and who continued to do so for other countries after World War II. Um, Schacht should have been imprisoned. He should have been uh, one of the war criminals who was, uh, because of his, his, his role, in, in conducting the war and financing the war, he should have been at the end of a hangman's noose like all the others, but he managed to escape that fate. He spent a couple of years in jail, uh, and then after that he became uh, a consultant to uh, companies and to countries around the world. He was a consultant to nations. He was a consultant to Sukarno's Indonesia, as an example. And he's the one, again, uh, who went to Indonesia, to went to Sukarno, and recommended that Sukarno create a kind of Islamic crescent, a new caliphate that would extend from Thailand all the way through Indonesia, uh, mostly most of Southeast Asia and the Philippines, 
as a buffer against communist China. So here, once again, is a Nazi uh, advising Muslims on creating a Muslim caliphate to defend against communism. And this was shocked back in 1952. So this is what we face. When we talk about the Bank of International Settlements, we're talking about one of the ways in which the Nazis were able to launder a lot of money. We don't know to this day how much money was laundered through that bank. We have no clue. We don't know how much gold was under the supervision of Thomas McKittrick and his, uh, his Nazi uh, colleagues at the bank. We have no idea. This just went on and on and on and has gone on to this day. We don't know what they're doing or how they're doing it. No one ever talks about them. They talk about the World Bank. They talk about the International Monetary Fund. But they don't really talk about the Bank of International Settlements. And it's still a very powerful, extremely uh, secretive institution. Uh, before we move uh, back to the Middle East and uh, the Islamic world, you've already touched on the uh, proposition by uh, Yalma. Horace Greeley Schacht was his full name. To, yes. To set up a Muslim caliphate in Indonesia as a bulwark against uh, communist China. Uh, if you would just briefly uh, talk about how the... Cold War and the post-war war, uh, mood in America basically favored Nazis and uh, also uh, worked against people who were anti-Nazi because they were perceived as pro-communist. Well, yeah, I mean, this, this information we just discussed, for instance, about the, the Bank of International Settlements, about BIS, um, was at the forefront of meetings that were being held in 1944, 1945, by the U.S. government. Um, we had people like Henry Morgenthau, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, who wanted to destroy BIS Bank, wanted to take it apart, and basically wanted to make sure that Germany would never develop an industrial capacity again. Um, but because he was Jewish, uh, it was considered to be you know, uh, sort of a Jewish hysterical reaction to what was taking place, and he was largely ignored. He tried to get um, the bank closed down. He tried to get uh, Germany to be completely um, deindustrialized. None of that happened. Uh, the Bretton Woods uh, Conference, uh, which was taking place, which was trying to decide what to do with, with Germany, with the finances and reparations, uh, wound up uh, giving a blank check to the very people that we were fighting. So uh, Morgenthau was extremely upset, and he became a target, uh, and his associates became targets of um, a red-baiting scare that began as the, uh, the Iron Curtain came down and as the warnings went out about the Soviet Union. Uh, all those who uh, opposed um, Nazism, those who uh, were in favor of something that made more sense, uh, in terms of real politics, in terms of American foreign policy, were shouted down. You had the rise of the McCarthy era. You had uh, people who were suddenly, we had switched from Nazis being the enemy to the communists being the enemy, specifically uh, the Soviet Union. But also, let's not forget, uh, China had gone communist also by 1948. So suddenly you had communists everywhere. Uh, and this hysteria that this uh, this new kind of economic, political ideology would take over the entire world had begun. Suddenly Stalin, who had been our ally uh, during World War II, was now our enemy. Uh, everything had gone completely upside down, and the Nazis, who had been our enemies, were now our friends. So you had the anti-communist hysteria was used as justification for working with Nazis, uh, both at home and abroad. Uh, it was used as justification for putting Nazis in position of power and uh, influence in the Middle East and in South America. Suddenly you had um, an anti-communist hysteria, which was actually greater, from my estimation, from what, what I read, greater than any kind of anti-Nazi hysteria that might have, been, that might have been taking place. There really wasn't a great deal of anti-Nazi sentiment in the United States uh, prior to the war. You had a lot of people who were very pro-Nazi, who thought that Hitler was doing a good thing for Germany, who believed in this kind of extreme nationalism who saw in socialism and in communism a threat uh, to their well-being. The banks, of course, saw socialism and communism as a threat. The corporations saw it as a threat. Uh, the labor unions were a threat, uh, and they were considered to be hotbeds of, of socialism and Russian-style communism. So 
it was a very intense period. It's the period that uh, I was born into and grew up with. Um, we were looking for communists under the bed. Uh, we, were, we saw communists everywhere. I mean, McCarthy was telling us that communists were running the government. Uh, he was stopping just short of calling, uh, or maybe he didn't, uh, Eisenhower a communist. But certainly uh, Truman and Roosevelt were considered communists, according to this theory. Uh, these were all communists that were putting communists in places of uh, extreme importance. The CIA was a hotbed of communism and leftist thinking. All of this was uh, was part of the the atmosphere at the time, very similar to today with our, our fear of terrorism uh, and this sort of almost uh, maniacal hysteria where terrorism is concerned, which kind of blots out any kind of calm, rational thinking about it. We had the same thing during the Cold War. And it gave us uh, the opportunity to become involved in international politics in a way that we really hadn't before. The U.S. had not really been that involved in the politics of other countries before the end of World War II. And after the end of the war, we suddenly became the superpower, especially after dropping the atomic bombs in Japan. So now suddenly we were the world's policemen, and we were going to be involved in international politics in a very profound way in a way that hasn't even hasn't stopped since then it changed everything for for america and for the world in general and suddenly we were the ones who were going to decide what was right what was wrong uh, who was on our side who was against us and we we divided the world into left and right we divided the world into two polar opposites it was the communist superpowers on one side and it was the america american superpower and its allies on the other and there was no middle ground and this is what we faced during that 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 period known as the cold war um, we were very uh, happy to work with people who had fought the Soviets during World War II, which meant not only the German, quote-unquote, Nazis, but also Eastern European uh, right-wing uh, fascist elements, uh, Ukrainian, Russian, uh, Croatian, you name it. Uh, whoever had fought the Nazi, whoever fought the communists rather during World War II was now a potential ally of the United States, and this just muddied the waters even more. Uh, we have uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, we have uh, just a few minutes left, Peter. Uh, we spent a fair amount of time in our first two interviews talking about Max von Oppenheim and the formulation of the concept of global jihad as a pro-colonial uh, device to recruit a proxy Warriors, uh, something that we're going to take up at greater length in our next talk, but that is uh, Hajimin al-Husseini, his alliance with the Third Reich, and then perhaps next week we can talk about how that too carried over into the post-war period. Uh, tell us about the Grand Mufti and his alliance with the Reich. Well, the Grand Mufti, uh, as we mentioned, was a man who uh, had gone to university in Egypt, um, who had fought on the side of the Ottoman Turks um, against the, the, the Allies during World War I. Of course, that, that battle had been lost. The Ottoman Empire was destroyed by the 1920s. It no longer existed. Uh, Al-Husseini was a Palestinian. He belonged to a very prestigious Palestinian family. I believe it was his brother who was mayor of Jerusalem at the time. So we have somebody with a very prominent family, very prominent background, um, who, however, saw that the, the Arab revolt uh, had been betrayed. Now remember, Husseini was not really part of the Arab revolt at the time. He was part of the Ottoman uh, army fighting against the Arab revolt. But once the dust had settled, he realized that the British and the French had carved up the region, had promised uh, a homeland to the Jews in Palestine, had done, had really gone back on any agreement that they had made with any of the Arab organizations. And of course, the Palestinians themselves had not been uh, brought into these conversations at all. They were not part of the of the uh, arrangements of the negotiations. In fact, there were no Arab signatories to the Sykes-Picot Agreement, uh, to the Balfour Declaration, or anything like that. Um, the Arabs were left out of these discussions. Um, they were considered kind of rabble. They were, you know, the serfs of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and even though they had helped in overthrowing the Ottoman Empire with the Arab Revolt, they were not considered uh, important enough to really include in these political deliberations of the 1915, 16, 17, and 18. So Hussein, al-Husseini, at the end, realized that uh, Palestine was going to be up for grabs. It really was being carved up into pieces by the Western powers, and a big chunk of it was going to be given to 
the state of Israel. So this is how Al Husseini began. He um, began with this vitriolic hatred of, of the West, of, uh, of, the, of the British and the French in particular, and that developed into a very cogent, uh, very consistent political ideology. Uh, eventually, during World War II, uh, he saw Hitler as being an anti-colonialist, just as the Kaiser was being portrayed as an anti-colonialist in World War I, someone who was going to fight the colonial powers of England and France. Now, Hitler was seen the same way. He was going to fight the colonial powers of, of uh, Britain and France, and also the colonial powers of the Netherlands and some of the other countries around the world, and of course against the Soviet Union. So Al Husseini saw in the Third Reich and in Hitler personally uh, a gift to Islam, a gift to his religion, a gift to his people. He was going to help liberate uh, Palestine from the clutches of the British and the French. So Al Husseini, uh, this ideologue, basically he wasn't a particularly well uh, read or uh, well-instructed theologian as far as uh, Islamic religion was concerned, even though he was the Mufti, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. It was a political appointment. Uh, he was, however, an ideologue. And al Husseini was able to go to Berlin. They gave him a villa in Berlin uh, from where he broadcast uh, in Arabic to the Middle East, telling them to support the Third Reich, telling them to support Hitler and the Nazis, to help them fight against the British and the French. He was extremely prominent uh, he was uh, shown in many photographs blessing a Muslim division of the SS, which took place in the Balkans. It was the Bosnian Mountain Division, the Hanshar Division of the SS. And so he was very well known, uh, well, both Peter, in Germany... Peter, and excuse and me for, for cutting you off, because we are out of time. Oh, Let, let's uh, develop this, and my, my fault, uh, let's develop this at a greater length next week, because it is so important and has uh, direct post-war implications for the, among other issues, the Israeli-Palestinian question, and others. Uh, Peter, where can people get your book? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, The Usual Suspects. You can get it at Amazon.com, uh, at Barnes & Noble. Um, and you can, of course, uh, look at my website, uh, PeterLavenda.com. Uh, I will update occasionally when I have new information, and there is some new information uh, there about some of the information in my book that uh, some of my readers have kindly uh, contributed. So, that's where you can go. Uh, people often ask me, what can I do about this? This is something modest uh, that people can do. They can get this book, and I have no financial uh, stake in this whatsoever. This concludes, for the record, program number 840, interview number 3 with Peter Lavenda about the Hitler legacy. For Peter Lavenda, this is Dave Emery saying thanks for listening. This is being recorded on March 22nd of the year 2015. Ciao.